like remember when I was applying for jobs. I literally walked in once and he yelled back, hey Joe, we got a little girl up here, wants to be a technician, you gotta see this. Since her first vehicle, a Volkswagen Bug, Bogey Latiner has been smitten with the automotive industry. She studied at UTI before becoming a BMW Master Tag and eventually opening her own shop. As we all know, the automotive industry is predominantly male, especially in the technician sector. Because of this, through her personal experiences, empowering women in the business has become her passion. Through her passion, she has been able to become a Master Tag, own a shop, own a training facility, become a TV host, become a shop consultant, and it certainly doesn't end there. Today we are talking about her story, how she got where she is, and where she plans on going. Bogey Latiner, empowering women since 2007. Welcome to the Cutting Edge Garage Podcast. All right, everybody, today we're with Bogey from Bogey's Garage. Bogey, thank you for taking the time to, uh, to be with us today. Tell us a little bit about yourself for those that don't know you. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Bogey. I'm an auto mechanic by trade. I've been an auto mechanic professionally for about 20 years now. Um, I've been a repair shop owner for many years. I sold that business relatively recently. Um, I also am one of the hosts of the TV show All Girls Garage. Um, I do a lot of shop management consulting in the industry uh, to help shop owners improve their customer service and employee retention. Um, I do all sorts of stuff in the industry, uh, just really passionate about um, improving the industry's reputation um, and bringing more diversity to the industry, specifically really passionate about bringing more women into the industry. And that's really one of the things that that interested me with, with having you on the podcast is... Um, I think that's an area that, that we're lacking in, in getting um, uh, females interested in the trade, specifically automotive. Okay. And um, um, How do you, know, you feel see... about getting cats involved in podcasts that I... like to eat my fingers? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely acceptable. Cat, cats are acceptable. <laughs> he's a total attention hog. And so whenever the camera turns on, he's like, oh, hey. <laughs> that, right. I'm supposed to be part of this. I'm, I'm the sidekick. Didn't you know that? 100%. <laughs> so you may or may not remember this, but we actually met before you had the show. Did we? When? Through what? And how? So so I figured you were going to say that. So <laughs> I mean, when you came on the camera, I thought you looked familiar, but I, I cannot place it. So th before you had the show, you were at an Autologic convention down in Orlando. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sitting, uh, drinking coffee one morning. This is, um, when, when the show first started, um, it was a few months after, after that, uh, convention oh. and my buddy, Michael calls me. He's like, man, you got to turn the, you got to turn the TV on. You're never going <laughs> to believe this. And, and boom, there, there you were. So <laughs> yeah, it was, it was pretty cool to, to, uh, uh, to see you on TV. And, and, and if you would walk us through, how you went from, you know, so I don't know how to politically, to say this politically correct. Um, Just say it. <laughs> there, there are, um, there are ladies that are in the entertainment business that are not necessarily mechanically inclined. Um, you're not one of those people. Um, you actually have that, that technical background and, yeah. and being the shop owner and stuff like that. And, and a lot of knowledge that goes into that. Or you wouldn't have been at the Autologic convention to begin with, right? Right. <laughs> so um, how did you go from being that shop owner, and, and if memory serves correctly, BMW specialist, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you go from that to to the <laughs> show, and, and what's that journey been like? You know, it's, it's so bizarre. I didn't intend or set out to be on television at all. Um, there was, there was a little moment where I thought I might want to. Um, and then that kind of got, I, I decided I didn't. And then suddenly there I was. So basically I was, I was just doing my thing. I was a mechanic full time. I had worked for BMW for about seven years. And then I started my repair shop. I was about three years into my shop. Um, when I got the the phone call for maybe four years, I don't remember exactly, but um, I was just kind of doing what a lot of new business owners were doing. I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off, trying to like keep all of the balls in the air and trying to wrench and do customer service and do and do all of the things. 
And um, I'm sorry, my cat is headbutting my laptop right now. No, nope, no worries. <laughs> He is such a punk. Um, and for a little while, I'd kind of thought that I might want to try to do a TV show at my shop. And we had a, a production company come by and spend two days with us. And at the end of it, he uh, he said, we love you. We love your shop. We think you're great. Um, but you're you're not enough of a, a B word. If I'm allowed to, I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on here, but I was yes. like, really? Okay, <laughs> so you're yeah. not, not enough of a bitch. And I'm like, Wow, I'm like, if that's what it takes to be on TV, I don't want to be on TV because that's that's not who I am. Um, and so I'd kind of written it off. And then this production company called me up. They were they had this concept for All Girls Garage. They'd already sold it to the network. They were looking for real mechanics to to fill the positions, and um, they wanted me to come out for an audition. And I was like, nope, not interested. <laughs> Because I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not enough of a bitch. Somebody's already told me we're not going right. down this road. Totally. Okay. Well, and at the time, I think TV, reality TV, particularly, was very much about the drama. It was about the fighting. It was about the craziness. And it is hard enough for women in this industry to be taken seriously and to be given a fair shot. And I did not want to be part of reinforcing that or making that harder. If, yeah. if anything, I wanted to be a part of making it better. Yeah, um, break that stereotype. Don't enforce it. Totally. So they convinced me that this was more educational and not about the drama. And I, I said, all right, I'll come out for an audition. We'll see how it goes. And I guess they liked me and <laughs> they've, they've kept me around for 10 years now. Um, but it's been a bizarre journey. It's been a very weird thing. Um, being a, a real world mechanic and being a TV mechanic are, are sometimes very different things. Um, set life is different than shop life. Um, and, and it's, it's different audiences and it's different, uh, criticisms and it's, it's just a whole lot to get used to. Better or worse? Different. Different. Okay. Just different. Yeah. You know, I think for me particularly, and, and kind of talking about women in the trades in general, I had, I had experienced a lot of sexism and a lot of, you know, not really cool behavior when I was working at the dealership. And then when I quit my job at the dealership and started my own shop, I was really insulated from that. I had really kind of created this shop environment where we didn't have customers coming to us that didn't, that had a problem with women working on their car, right? So right. I got, I had this little protective bubble. I was a 90% female run shop. So most of my employees were women. Um, my customers were both male and female, but they were really supportive and and or just didn't care that we were women, right? It was either like, yes, that's all nice little bubble to live in. <laughs> and then I went back on TV or you know, got on TV and all of a sudden I was thrown back into the, oh, you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not talented enough. You're not a real mechanic or you're not cute enough to be on TV or like just all of the, the whole range of spectrum of criticism and so is this um, coming from the fan base or, or from people watching? I don't know if they're okay. necessarily fans, if they're criticizing, but, um, <laughs> but the, some people just have to hate, even if they're fans, they just, it's just inherent totally. in their nature. Totally. And it was so bizarre to me. I still, to this day, you know, mechanic for 20 years on the show for 10 years. Um, I, I still will go to a car show and have people walk up to me and just grab my hands to look at them and inspect and say, are you really a mechanic? Do you really know what you're doing? So it's interesting, but I will say most of the support is overwhelmingly positive or most of the feedback. Well, if, if you're doing it right and you're using your head, you don't necessarily have to have calluses and, and gloves help tremendously with gloves that. Gloves are well. a wonderful, that's always what I say. Like your hands aren't dirty. I'm like, yeah, there's these things called gloves. Yeah. Amazing. I, when, when, when I was still turning wrenches, this is years ago when, when I first got married, um, my wife hated the, the dirt and grime on, on my fingers. So I started wearing uh, medical gloves long before anybody was was actually using those mainstream in the shop. So my hands have been silky smooth ever since. Oh, did we lose her? Bogey, are you with me? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the wonders of modern technology. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> so so walk us through the, the rest of how, how do you deal with that? Be, I'm a father of four girls. So if, and, and most of them are adults at this yeah. point, but it doesn't really matter. They're still my girls. So if someone's mean to them, um, <laughs> I want to bury them in a hole. 
and um and I can just you know I've I've been in shops my entire career. I can just imagine I've I've never worked with with a female technician. Um but but I can imagine the hell that they would go through because guys are just um cruel. And they're cruel so, to each other um, and right. <laughs> Sometimes I think that was a big rev, like a big notice for me when I was younger and I was first getting into the to the industry. I I had to kind of realize like oh they're not just being mean to me, they're being mean to each other. And um, I, when I, I first started out as a mechanic, I was in New York and New York um, oh my. New Yorkers right New Yorkers are are very much known for being in your face about their opinions. Yep which was both awesome and awful at the same time. Um, I knew where people stood right off the bat. They they were either cool or they weren't. They would tell me to my face I didn't belong there. They didn't want me there. Or they would tell me, you know, don't pay attention to that guy. He's, you know, he's whatever. <laughs> but um, I, I think kind of in New York, I especially learned if they're not talking shit to my face, they're talking shit behind my back. And so it's so better that they be talking to me. Right. <laughs> right? Right. Um, I, I take issue a little bit with with some of the the crap that we do to each other in this industry in general, male, female, doesn't matter. Um, I think it's one of, personally, I think it's one of the reasons why we have a hard time attracting more people to the industry and and keeping people in the industry. It leads to the perception that we're less than professional as an industry. Um, and especially when new people come into the industry, like why are we mean to them? They're, they're expressing an interest. There's so many barriers of entry into this industry. And then they come in and we tell them to go turn on the reverse air or, um, you know, check their blinker. the radiator or, for the super beetle. It, yes, exactly. And it's just, it's not cool. Um, <laughs> so I take issue with that in general. But I think for me personally. I've been guilty of all that, by the way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, one of, I'm one of those guys. Sorry. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> okay. No more. I promise. <laughs> it just, you know, we have so many barriers of entry to this industry. It's, it's the education, it's the tools, it's, there's so much knowledge that needs to be learned and gathered to be good at this. Um, there's a lot of support systems and parents and teachers who aren't encouraging their kids to do this. So if a, if a kid is saying, I really want to go into the automotive industry and and be a mechanic or be a body tech or be a metal worker. Like there's a lot of barriers to keeping them from doing that. No wonder we have a shortage. No wonder we have like projected 600,000 technician shortage by the year 2030, which is not that far away. Like that's insane. And then, and then we make it worse by being mean to them. So, (laughs) but I think, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say it, it you you're you're absolutely right. It's it's difficult to find someone that wants to be in this trade. And and the investment that you have to make both in in time and in tools, there are other trades that or or skills that that you can go to school for, make relatively the same money without the investment and um you know, that's where that shortage comes from. So yet you, you take what little uh group of people that we have that that are showing an interest and and then we you know help them make the decision that this isn't what i want to do because those people suck right, right? Totally, so. totally and then they get an offer for ten dollars more an hour right. with way less harassment at being in you know an elevator tech or a robotics repair person or a painter or construction or whatever it is they want to do and they're like oh okay why am i putting through myself through all that they have to really want it i, I think for me like i really wanted it and i a lot of the the challenges that I faced, especially at my first dealership, um, where there was a lot of not so supportive individuals, um, I think in the end it made me stronger because I, I, there was something in me that that allowed me to use that as fuel for my fire. Like, what do you mean I can't do this? What do you mean I don't belong here? Watch me, and it made me want to be my best. I think it's unfortunate that a lot of women that I talk with in this industry feel like they have to be 10 times as good to get half the respect that that shouldn't be the case. Um, but what it, but what it does is it drives us to greatness and it drives us to perfecting our skill and perfecting our craft just to be taken half as seriously, (laughs) but, um, but you know, it works out. And and, and that's true. And, and, and I've worked with a lot of guys that, you know, honestly should go do something else. Um, you know, there's Barber College or, 
or whatever. They shouldn't ever be working on a vehicle, and, and they wouldn't deal with the same criticisms that, that um, a young female technician would, would deal with. Yeah. You know, it's fun as a as a shop management consultant. I work with shop owners all over the country, and and I often get you know interesting comments from people. And uh, one gentleman, and I've actually heard this many a time, said to me, uh, I, "I hired a female mechanic once. She was awful. I'll never hire a female mechanic again." Did you ever and hire just, a horrible male? Mechanic? Right. So you <laughs> right. should I never just, hire. I just smiled never and hire like, any so, of those guys ever again either. You've never had yeah. a bad male tech. <laughs> Right. Oh, yeah, of course. So do you not hire men anymore? Like what? I don't understand right. the logic here. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Like, it he just didn't doesn't either matter. until you said that to him. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah, and he's <laughs> like, wait, wait a minute. Okay, it just clicked. Oh, oh got it. Yeah. Right. That's funny. <laughs> That's awesome. So the show has changed, has it not? It's not, is it, it's not all girls garage anymore, is it? Is it? It's still all girls garage. Yeah. Okay. So our hosts have changed. So it started out, it was myself, Christy Lee, and Jesse Combs. Okay. Uh, then Jesse Combs left and we got Rachel DeBarros. And Rachel left a year ago, two years, okay. two years ago. Okay. And Faye Hadley joined. And now it is just myself and Faye Hadley. Okay. So um, what are your plans going forward with the show? What, what do you... Where, where do you want to, where do you want to take the show and, and how do you want to utilize that to further your calls, if you will, question. if you want to call it that? Yeah. So, you know, I, I don't have a lot of control over the direction of the show itself. Um, but I, I have, I have used the, the notoriety, I guess, the attention that the show has brought me. Uh, I sold my general repair shop and I started another shop in, in Phoenix where I'm from um, or where I live uh, called Girl Gang Garage. And while it's it's completely separate from the TV show, um, it's really my my passion and my 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 mission in life. So we we do workshops and classes to introduce women to the trades. And then we do these big scale all female builds. Where, that we bring to SEMA, that we start in raw metal and bring it all the way up to finished show car, run and driving, um, do everything in between. And, and it's really all about bringing women in the trades together, creating opportunities for more women to explore the trades and create more conversations around women in the trades. Every time we bring it to a car show, we're getting to talk to people about about the fact that there are women in the industry. There are women who want in the industry. And yeah, when you watch TV, you can you see the you see me and you see Christy Lee and you see the Faye Hadley and you see the handful of other women here and there that are doing doing stuff in the industry but everybody kind of tends to think that they're the only ones if they've never worked with another female mechanic or seen another female mechanic they're like oh it's just those those handful of ladies that do this stuff no right. there's thousands of us thousands of amazing women in the industry and there's a ton more who would love the opportunity to to get hands on and explore the trades. So how do you how do you go about the outreach? How do you get you know, people into the classes? I mean, obviously it's you've got social the, media and word okay. of mouth. Honestly, uh, the first all female build I did not expect to be as large as it was. We wound up having over ninety women involved, and um and I I was scared nobody was going to come, but word got out and women were just there were so many professional women who were excited about the opportunity to work with other women. And there were so many hobbyists and newbies who were like, I want to play. I want to learn how to weld. I want to, this is awesome. I've always wanted to learn and I've never had a chance that it, it like grew and grew and grew very organically. So we honestly don't have to do a lot to fill the classes. I've been teaching basic car care classes at my former shop and even in my living room for the past, I don't know, 18 years since I you know, was first starting out in the industry. I never have a problem filling seats. People want to learn. They really do. Do you come from an automotive background? Your nope. your family? No. So <laughs> so how did so how did you get into automotive? My parents do not know where I came from. Um, <laughs> my my mother is a Jersey girl. She doesn't even like pumping her own gas, uh, and she's she's okay with me blasting her and saying that because <laughs> it's true. Um, <laughs> my my dad was into like the looks of classic cars, but not the work like, to get them there. 
Yeah, and not really like a lot. Like we had a cute little car show that happened in my town and we would, he and I would go walk and check it out. And my brother would like to go to um, the the, the auto, New York auto show at the Javits Center back when, because he was into the, the design of the newer stuff. But there wasn't, it, other than that, there wasn't a whole heck of a lot. They had no idea where I came from. I wasn't interested in cars at first, honestly. <laughs> um, I wanted to be a dancer and then I wanted to be a lawyer and I for a brief while thought I wanted to be a politician. I have since decided I'm very grateful I decided against that. Um, <laughs> but I, um, I was in love. Automotive's with, a much cleaner profession. I, totally. Totally. You know, it's funny kind of side tangent. My um I, I have a, a lawyer friend who tells me all the time, he's like, you made the right choice. He's like, I, I always wanted to be a mechanic and I chose to be a lawyer, you made the right choice. And it's ironic because I hear from other mechanics all the time, you had a chance to be a lawyer and you didn't take it. But the, you know, the grass is always greener on the on the a other side. Absolutely. Um, but my, my passion started with Volkswagen Bugs. Okay. And I loved them. I wanted one. I was a little hippie kid. I had dreadlocks, believe it or not. Oh, God, Bogey, you got to get me. So when Bill, <laughs> when, when Bill edits these, he puts in pictures and snippets. So he's going to have some, he's going to add some footage from, from your social and stuff that you got to get me one of the dreadlock pictures. I got to see okay. this. I, I have a picture of myself in high school auto shop with my with my Volkswagen bug up in the yep. air with my dreadlocks and my little do rag and yeah yeah I definitely got to see that without a <laughs> doubt that's awesome that's awesome so so yeah I, I and I'm convinced that Volkswagen bugs are like the gateway drug to cars because more mechanics I know became mechanics because of Volkswagen bugs uh so I I bought well, I, before I bought it, I was researching Volkswagens and which year do I buy and how do I know if it's a good one? And my parents were not supportive of me buying a bug, so they were not helping me at all. And I started reading these Volkswagen magazines and it was the mid 90s. And you know what shows up in Volkswagen magazines? Women in high heels and bikinis, right? <laughs> and that was the only time women showed up. And me being a little hippie 16 year old was like, that's unacceptable. This isn't, this isn't unacceptable, exactly. <laughs> and I decided that not only was I going to buy a bug, but I was going to restore it myself. And I was going to have an article written about me in one of those magazines. And I wasn't going to be in a bikini. <laughs> and fast forward a few years and you've been in magazines. And I'm guessing you were not in a, biki in a, biki in a bikini. No. Yeah. no, nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was that was kind of how it started. So I, I, I had this kind of this bug, this idea, and I decided to take auto shop in high school, and so I could learn. I convinced my shop teacher to let me bring the bug into shop, and we dismantled it. And with the help of my shop class, we did a whole lot of work to it. Found a mentor who would help me rebuild the engine. I got a job as a painter's apprentice to get a paint job for a, an affordable price, and rebuilt the whole thing. And really at the time, you know, a lot of people told me I shouldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Girls didn't belong. I was only the second female in my entire high school's auto shop class. And the more they told me those negative kind of pushback kind of opinions, the more it made me want to do it and the more of a challenge it became. But I never really thought it was a career path. And, and to be honest, nobody came to our high school auto shop and talked to us about career path options. I don't think any of us really knew that this was a thing we could do for a living. Right. And so I, I went off to college like I was supposed to do. And and that was, you know, it wasn't a question of, are you going to go to college? It was a question of which college. So I went and I did that. And I realized I really, really, really missed working on cars. And I missed the challenge of building and making things and taking something broken and wrapping your brain around the problem and figuring it out and then seeing it drive off. I'm like, I did that. I made that happen. And that was a, that was a love that I didn't know I was going to get. It kind of came out of nowhere. Um, but once, once I fell in love with that, it, it became my driving force. So. That's awesome. That's, that's an awesome story. Um, so you started the, the, the new garage um, and that is, designed specifically to um, drive the education and 
and enticement to, to get um, women in the trades. Yeah. Are you working with any schools or programs to, you know, for scholarships for, you know, how does that, how does that work? So you're using the shop and, and your fame, if you will, to get the interest, where do, what's the next step? What, what happens once you get there, once they're there intrigued and you have their interest, what, what do you do now? Yeah. So I, we don't see ourselves as a technical school. We're not training people for the workforce. We are creating a bit of a funnel and creating interest and then helping them find those resources if they are interested. So whether it is they, they're just wanting to become a hobbyist, we're you know, trying to help and support that as much as we can. Uh, and then I also do a ton of work with the Tech Force Foundation which I'm not sure if you're familiar, they're a, a fantastic nonprofit organization that gives millions of dollars away in scholarships every year. And they do a ton to, to both get kids to and through tech school, like keeping them in and making sure that they can stay there financially, but, but also helping really change the perception of the automotive industry and, and help shed that, that grease monkey reputation. Yep. So I do a lot of work with them um, I don't have any scholarships, you know, personally that I that I do. Um, I put all of my money into the shop, <laughs> but and that's easy to do. That's right. very easy. But we to also do. don't charge our, you know, the women who participate in the builds. We keep the classes very low cost. Uh, they're really meant to be a very low barrier of entry kind of opportunity to explore safely. So. So yeah, in that sense, everything is a scholarship, right? <laughs> so so what could we do? Um, so we have a, we, we're starting a program. I actually hired a guy. Um, I, I believe in getting youth into the trades in, in general, Be, because I'm a father of four girls. I also have an interest in getting girls into the trades. Um, but, but in general, as a company, we have a, a big interest in making sure that, that we have future generations of, of technicians. And, you know, obviously there's an ulterior motive for that. If I don't have any technicians out there, I don't have anybody to sell to, but okay. it's, it's, it's honestly more, um, much more organic than that. The, the program is, is geared to be as helpful as we can to the technicians going into, um, into the workforce or, or starting the, going through the trade schools and then, you know, entering the workforce. So the guy that we hired to head up that program is a guy that's actually done that. He's a, he, he was a Chrysler master tech okay. and, um, he went through that, that whole recently went through that whole transition from going through the trades, you know, having to pay for the student loans, having to buy the tools, having to do this and all the things that you would do different, um, mm -hmm. things that you wouldn't do again. Um, and so we approach it from, from that perspective when he goes out and he meets with um, the students and, and visits the schools and things like that. What could we that. do better to help encourage the females that, that he's going to run into? You know, I think it, it's really the same. It's really the same stuff. Um, I think for women, particularly, we, we need to hear that, that we're welcome and that there's others like us out there and that have been successful. Um, I think social media has done a really good job of of creating opportunities for that. When I came up, social media didn't exist. I couldn't see other women. And I think that was the biggest barrier. There, there wasn't anybody that looked like me. So showing images of both men and women, making sure that if you are handing out literature, showing videos, um, that they are inclusive and that each of the students in the class can see someone who looks like them in the in the video, whether male or female, right? Uh, I think that's the biggest piece. I think, honestly, as far as attracting women in general on a broader spectrum, it it really is the same, the same stuff. It's we we need to create a great work environment for everybody. Men and women both appreciate it. Women are just going to be more vocal about it. But making sure that we're encouraging shops to have clean workspaces, to be well lit, to have nice bathrooms, to um, have good tools, to have safety, to have opportunities for growth, to, to be respected, to be encouraged. Like all of those things are the things that women are looking for in an employer. And I think realistically men as well, you know, <laughs> it's all if, of the best if, employees if want the if, same things. Yeah. If What's they're that? worth hiring, if, if they're worth yeah. hiring, they're, they're wanting those things. I promise you. Yeah. Totally. So I think when it comes to encouraging kids, I think it's just showing them 
what good there is in the industry and how to differentiate between the good shops and the bad shops and not to to get bogged down. I find so often with both men and women as, as students, they go out, they get their first job and maybe it's not a great shop. Maybe they get treated poorly, either as male or female. And they feel like they have to stay and they don't feel like they can go and move or they feel like it's because they're young or because they're new and that's why it's not great. There are some not so great shops out there. That's the reality. There are some amazing shops out there. And so helping kids to know you are learning an amazing skill set. You have a ton of opportunity in front of you. There are great shops out there who are hungry for you and who will treat you well, regardless of who you are, regardless of whether you're male or female, and they will give you opportunities to learn and grow. Go find those shops, go find those, those people, interview them as much as they're interviewing you because it's, it's, you can go anywhere. There's such a shortage. As a technician, you can go anywhere, find a shop that is willing to take you under their wing and mentor you and grow you and give you opportunity to, to learn. How much of a difference have you noticed um, or, or any difference at all from uh, your previous shop to what you're doing now in terms of the customers that come through the door um, and, and their approval? We don't have or, any customers. Okay. <laughs> So, so the current shop is not about customers just at all. Strictly training. Strictly training. Okay. I do I have some private client work that I do here and there. I'm starting to build that up a little bit because a lot of our training opportunities wind up being metal work, body work, paint work, and there's not as much of the mechanical to do. So I am taking on some private client work and we'll be using those as mechanical training opportunities. Um, in addition to the classes that we do, so giving some hands-on opportunities. But generally speaking, no, we're not we're not doing customer-based work. It is it is very much solely focused around learning and connection. Okay. And I okay. do miss that a little bit. I miss uh, I miss my customers from my old shop. I miss that energy. But they um, uh, did you sell the shop to a female? I did not. Sadly, you did not. Sadly, okay. No. <laughs> it's that's hard to find man <laughs> it, it is well and so right that's why you're here it, it is it's um yeah. i have met um a few people in in the related to the automotive industry that that are female that are more um not necessarily really into automotive it's just more um talent or personality and, and, yeah. and less actually about the trade. Um, so for me, it's really neat to run into to a female that's really into automotive. Um, yeah. And then, of course, to have a, a spirited debate with you about rotating tires and then see you on TV was was fun as well. So. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, you know, there, there's a place for everybody. Uh, and I, I appreciate the women who are involved in the industry more on a, you know, a host or a model or a whatever it is basis. I, as, as long as you own what you are and what, and what you're doing, I, I've always had a ton of respect for Christy Lee, my former co-host, because you know, she's very much a car girl. She very much knows her stuff. And, and yet she's very clear that she, she is a TV host. She's not a mechanic by trade, but she does know her stuff, probably more than a lot of mechanics, but she's very clear about what, what she is. And I think there's right. a place for everything. We need we need visible hobbyists. We need women who aren't doing this professionally, but just find cars interesting because it, it normalizes it. But yeah, there there are also a ton of, of women who are technicians. A lot of them are just out in the field doing their thing. And they're not on TV, they're not on social media because they're just doing their thing, right? So that's kind of the conundrum that winds up happening. But women do make up about two and a half percent of all automotive technicians. Okay. When I started out in the industry, we were just 1.8. So <laughs> we're that's we're progress. growing. <laughs> progress. Now is that is that across all genres? So so we we had the opportunity to meet a really cool young lady that is a Harley tech, um, mm. which was which was pretty neat. Her dad um, is, was a Harley Master Tech, and nice. they, you know, he I guess got her into it, or you know, yeah. from from her growing up. So is that you know motorcycle? I'm not you know, positive. I I don't know that for a fact. I can't say. I have I do know of quite a few female motorcycle technicians. Um, so 
I'd, I'd be curious to know if that's a more accepting area. Um, it's been interesting through the all female builds working with women fabricators, women body techs, women painters, women like th throughout the kind of spectrum of the automotive industry and and totally unscientifically, like this was not a formal study at all. This was purely just kind of gut from talking to everybody and hearing all their stories. Automotive repair, mechanical work is the hardest, is the least accepting for women. That, that was my next question is where, yeah. where is it, you know, where is it hardest? Where is it easiest yeah. for, for women to be accepted? There's a ton of women in body work. There's okay. a ton of women painters. There are lots of women welders. I know several female welders who have said to me, I wanted to be a mechanic, <clears throat> but it was so challenging and nobody would give me a shot. I went over and tried welding and they accepted me with open arms. So it's an interesting thing. Whereas there's, I don't know what it is about the automotive mechanical side that we're, we're a little slow. <laughs> to, to get with the program on accepting people we're, we're it is still, changing we're still dragging our knuckles a little bit <laughs> just just a little bit and and it's really it really truly is not just um is, is not just the the women that that struggle with that i i remember the the hell that i went through when i got into the business and even as a master tech when when i moved so i'm originally from baltimore and i spent most of my career in baltimore and it's that in your face, you know, run your mouth, you know, like mm -hmm. New York. Um, yeah. And, and I moved to Alabama and actually Florida Panhandle, same thing. Okay. Um, and I was in the middle of nowhere with guys that that actually hated me because I was a Yankee. And I didn't understand that. I thought we were just, you know, mm. jawing back and forth. So, you know, we got into a lot of spirited debates and, and I didn't realize how close I came to actually getting into a fight in the shop. <laughs> so, you know, if, if I was, if I were female, that would have been 10 times worse than, than what it already was. And that's actually how I got into the tool and equipment business. It was such a miserable environment for me. I went to my snap on guy and I'm like, where the hell can I go? And, you know, turn wrenches, somebody appreciates, you know, good work. And, and I don't have to deal with all this stupidness. Yeah. And, um, and, and that's got a me, shame. It, it is, it is. It's I mean, it, it worked out great for me. I've got a great career, but. Totally, totally. But it's not just you. And a lot of people aren't staying within the industry. They're just leaving. Right. I can't tell you how many, both men and women I hear from on a regular basis who have had negative experiences in the industry and left. And we're having a hard enough time attracting people to the industry. Right. And then we're not able to keep them because of our culture. And I love the automotive industry. And I, I think there's a ton of amazing, amazing individuals and human beings who are, are fantastic people doing wonderful things. There's a ton of really great shops. There's a ton of really great folks. I, I love the people that I've met. But I knew there was a but coming. Right. But we need we need to work on our image we need to work on our culture and i think there's a big movement towards that i think the number of like really quality shops are are growing and they're very committed to to culture and creating good work environments and being respectful and professional and all of the rest of the things uh, but there's still a lot of the old stereotype that exists and it's it needs to go away. We need to get with the next century. And and I think the customers are doing that. I, I think the customers are are they're demanding more. So so they, they used to they used to settle for less. They used to totally. accept less. And now totally. they're now they're accept their their acceptance of a lack of professionalism isn't what it used to be. They're you know they're right. just going to take their vehicle somewhere else. And so those knuckle draggers, as I referred to them. Are, are going away, um, you know, through attrition, um, I, I one at so. a time. And we have to hold each other accountable and we have to be okay with saying this isn't okay. You know, when, when I stand up against bullying in the shop, you're like, oh, whatever, it's because you're a girl. I'm like, no, it's because I care about this industry. It's because if we want to be respected, if we want to be paid what we deserve to be paid, if we want to be able to charge 
as a shop, what we deserve to charge as a shop. If we want to be respected, if we want to be able to say, I'm an automotive technician and have people be like, that's awesome. We need to take ourselves seriously. Right. And we need to treat ourselves professionally and with respect and one another with respect. And if we don't do that, why is everybody else gonna? Right. You know? And, and, and that's difficult in, in certain areas, you know, there's, with what I do with equipment, um, you know, and I've been in the equipment business for a long time and, and somewhere along the lines owned a shop as well while I was doing that because I needed something to do with the other five minutes of my life. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> you, you you go to a particular area and, and you try to do a training class, right? So so I'm traveling, I you know, I travel the whole country and, and I can go to one area and you have that camaraderie. Uh, amongst the shops, there's there's a higher level of professionalism. Uh, yeah. They they show each other, even if they don't like each other, they show each other a, a professional level of respect. Um, so you can have a class in one of those shop owners' shops, um, and everybody will come. Yeah. And then you go to other areas, and you try to do that in a shop, and you won't get anybody there. And it doesn't matter what shop you do it in; there is no common ground. Right. Um, in, in that area. So you've got to find a trade school or you've, you know, you have to find, you know, a municipality or something like that that's willing to let you do the class because you can't get the shop owners to show up at so-and-so shop. They just won't even right. come for a training class. It's, it's ridiculous. And that starts with the shop owners, right? It it's does. The personality of the shop and the technicians that work there, it starts with the owner. And I'm excited about the future. Like I really see this younger generation of shop owners coming up who are going to all the, the trainings, they're doing all the workshops, they're excited about doing things differently. And, and they're coming in with this energy and they're building these really cool environments and really cool shops and really supportive professional places. And uh, I, think, I think the future is bright if we can get there. <laughs> Uh, I, I think we're going to get there one way or the other, you know, um, um, and it, in, in addition to the negativity associated with automotive in general, I think the, the concept of it's OK to to be in a trade versus I have to have a four year degree. You know, that's a concept that we're pushing really hard in this country. And, um, you know, one of the companies that I import from is from Italy. So that that was a paradigm there 20 years ago. And and with free education, everybody has a four year degree, but you can't find a plumber. Literally, you can make more money as a plumber's apprentice out of out of high school than than you can with a four year degree. And and there's so so many uh, people with degrees that are unemployed over there. It's okay to not, you know, the message needs to be, it's okay if this is what you want to do and this is your passion. Totally. It's not a, you know, it's not a negative thing. It's totally. not a failure or anything else. I think, I think the pendulum is swinging. I think there's a couple of factors that go into that. You know, one is the, the reputation of the industry that we need to work on fixing. Nobody else can do that except for those of us in the industry to change right. that reputation. So that's a piece of it. And then we've, we obviously had the huge push for four-year college. Like that was the one path. And I think there's this natural thing for parents to want more for their kids than they had for themselves. And so a lot of, you know, my parents' generation, they were often the first kids to have gone to college in their families. Right. And they, of course, wanted that for their kids. And, you know, for my parents, it was they went to a, a city school. They wanted me to go to like a good college, right? So it was like every generation wants more for their kid. I talked to, to mechanics and electricians and plumbers and all of the rest all the time who said, there's no way I want my kid doing this. So we've got that piece happening too. But I think right. there is a, a shift happening thanks to you know all of these kinds of programs and um, Mike Rowe and a lot of you know the other folks that are out there really pushing the the idea that there is more than one path to success and that if we don't have people to fix the things 
we don't have a society. Right. If we don't have somebody to fix the trucks that bring the food from the farm to the grocery store, what do you do? Right. <laughs> right? Society comes to a screeching halt. We have And somebody's going to be complaining saying, oh my God, why is there no more fix it people out there? Yeah. Totally. So it's it's a multifaceted kind of problem that needs to be attacked in in multiple different ways. And I, I think if you often ask me, how do we get more women in the industry? I'm like, well, it's all part of this bigger puzzle. Right? right? It's the respectability of the industry. It's getting parents to be supportive of their kids going into this. It's building the reputation of the trades in general and showing that that, that is a phenomenal career path. And there's nothing to be ashamed about that. And it's you can make a ton of opportunity and a ton of money for yourself in the trades. So it's all of those parts and pieces kind of coming together. How, how many women do you meet that, that show an interest that share with you that their family were their biggest detractors? Often, very often, both women who are already in the trades expressing that their parents weren't supportive or women who come out for my basic car care class or welding classes or come out for the builds. And, and they say, you know, I always wanted to learn this. My dad was a welder, but he would never teach me. Didn't, didn't want me out in the shop. So I, I hear that a lot. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I do also to... hear the other side a lot, which is nice too, right? I hear a lot of women who say my, my dad was super supportive of this. And so that's, that's always good to hear too. Okay. Awesome. So, Bogey, how do people get in touch with you? And and not necessarily <laughs> directly, but but how do they find you? I know you're um I've seen you a lot, not so much on on Facebook, but I've seen you a lot on LinkedIn. And and that might just be because I'm not on Facebook that much. But <laughs> I you know, I try to do Facebook. I personally I don't really do it at all. I think I haven't done a personal post on Facebook in like four years. Um, but I do have my my fan page on Facebook as well as on Instagram. Instagram is probably the best. Uh, also, my website, bogeysgarage.com. Um, Instagram, Girl Gang Garage, as well as Bogies Garage. I do some LinkedIn stuff as well. I'm on TikTok now. I'm doing a, some, a series of basic uh, car information kind of videos on TikTok. Okay. Awesome. Crazy miss. Who knew? So, yeah, you, you can find me just about anywhere. It's always going to be under the name Bogies Garage and girl okay. gang garage for my shop any affiliates that people need to know about are, are you expanding what you're doing with with girl gang and, um, and doing that in different areas or not so not so much yet unfortunately maybe one day soon but uh okay. um ton of work with tech force definitely encourage people to check that out it's a great organization doing a ton for our industry um obviously you can find find me on girl on all girls garage on motor trend um, and and reach out. I'd love to talk to people. I love uh, I love chatting about the industry and any ladies out there. Definitely, I would love to hear from you. I love connecting with other women in the industry. Awesome. Well, thank you for uh, thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. thank you. Appreciate it. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again soon in the Cutting Edge Garage. <laughs>